Tina Koto Katwa. On behalf of the Howick Youth Council, we would like to welcome all those watching to our Recruit Your MP Botany Candidates Forum. We're grateful for those watching at home and our election forum tonight is interactive for all participants. If you'd like to participate in tonight's forum from home, we encourage you to visit youth.org.nz slash hyc. That's youth.org.nz slash hyc for our live audience polling and the opportunity to ask candidates questions. The criteria for inclusion for tonight's debates was all candidates whose parties are polling above 2% in nationwide polling in addition to the incumbent candidate. Tonight we're joined by Nacy Chen from Labour, Christopher Luxon from National, and Damien Smith from the ACT Party. Up until this morning, incumbent Botany MP Jamie Lee Ross was also a confirmed candidate to be present at this forum. However, with his announcement today that he is no longer contesting the Botany electorate, he called to withdraw his attendance at tonight's debate. This means, though, that the Botany electorate is going to be represented by a new MP in Parliament today. And we're delighted to give you, the people who live in Botany, a chance to hear from and ask questions of some of the contenders for the future MP of Botany. This event has been put together by Team 5 of the Howick Youth Council, which is led by Liane Tuburkost over here and includes Daniela romero Mittelstadt, Amy Liang and Anika Lee. The success of these forums is down to their hard work over the past few months. However, unfortunately, they weren't able to be present at tonight's event due to COVID-19 restrictions. So what is the Howick Youth Council? We're a volunteer group of 32 young people, all young people who live, work or study in the East Auckland area. We have both open seat members and school seat members from our nine local high schools. We're proudly funded by the Howick Local Board to represent the 20,000 young people in the geographic area stretching from Bucklands Beach down to Ormiston. Our aims are to represent young voices to initiate change in the community, to facilitate opportunities for youth to develop, and to create connections in our diverse community. We have three amazing moderators helping us facilitate the event tonight. Zach Wong, who is a longtime Youth Voice Group member and current chair of the Board of Auckland Youth Voice. He has extensive experience in forum moderation, beginning with the mayoral electoral races in 2016 and 2019, reaching all the major candidates. He's also run forums in a more local context for the 2018 Howick Councillors by-election and the three local board election forums run by the Howick Youth Council last year. In his spare time, he is a student at the University of Auckland. Denitza Lule Weitenberg is the current secretary on the Howick Youth Council's leadership team this year. She moderated the Howick Youth Council's three local board election forums last year, with all 28 running candidates present from across the three subdivisions. Denitza is also a student at the University of Auckland. Uh, our final moderator tonight is uh, Liane Tabokhurst. She is the team lead of Team 5, which has coordinated this event, and she helped with the moderation of the Howick Youth Council's three forums last year. She also delivered the East Auckland Youth Film Festival in 2019 and is leading its delivery again this year. Liane is a Year 13 student at one of the local high schools. Tonight's forum focuses on the people running to be elected as electorate MPs, who will represent and advocate on behalf of local causes within Parliament, their party caucuses and elsewhere. There are more than 20,000 young people under the age of 25 living in East Auckland. We want to make sure they, as well as the wider botany community, are empowered to have a say in their local governance and have a better understanding of exactly who they're voting for. Tonight, we'll be using Zetings, which is an interactive platform that allows you to interact with us and the candidates in real time. By using your device and following the link on the screen, youth.org.nz slash hyc, You'll be able to view the presentation on your device, partake in live audience polling, and submit questions for the candidates. We are expecting a short delay between the live stream and the Zetings presentation that you'll see on your phone. So you'll see the answers displayed on your screen before you see them on the live stream. Since Auckland is at alert level 2.5 tonight, while we had hoped to hold this event in person, we've been able to adapt it. We are currently adhering to the 10 person limit with social distancing enforced and no in-person audience. We would also like to thank NUNC for supporting our youth council and managing the live streaming of tonight. NUNC is a youth led local business started during lockdown, which provides live streaming services, video conferencing and aerial media. We're really grateful for their expertise and highly recommend their work. Tonight's program will start with opening statements along with questions for each candidate. We will then move to topic-specific questions. 
Topic specific questions will give the audience a sense of each candidate's views on the topic. For the candidates, they'll get 60 seconds per question with a bell ringing once at 45 seconds and twice at 60 seconds when the time limit is reached. We are strict if you were watching last night and we'll cut candidates off if they go over time. Also during this time, if a candidate has already spoken, uh, we will offer candidates a chance to respond to any direct comments from other candidates about them or their party for 30 seconds. Throughout the night, there'll be audience polling questions, which will provide audience input on the questions discussed. We'll be using our online tool settings for this, so make sure you join the via the link youth.org.nz slash hyc. We're also excited to have other audience participation tonight and to be taking audience questions both during the specific topics and the chance to answer some general questions at the end. To contribute to audience questions, you can join settings at youth.org.nz slash hyc and post questions to the activity wall. You can also ask questions by commenting on our Facebook page. For audience questions, candidates will get 45 seconds to answer them, and there'll be one bell at 30 seconds and two bells at 45 seconds. We'll now move on to the opening statements, but first we do have an audience poll and on Zetings, and this is, do you already know who you're voting for? Uh, do the candidates know who they're voting for? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, they answered yes. <laughs> We're getting some movement. It's 50-50 at the mm. moment. Um, we'll now move on to the opening statements. The candidate opening statements are a chance for candidates to introduce themselves and why they are running. They will give a brief overview of their background, values and goals. We'll be maintaining very strict timekeeping. 90 seconds total, bell rings once at 75 seconds and twice at 90 seconds. We will cut candidates off if they continue after the time limit. We will go in alphabet alphabetical order by last name, so we'll start with Nacy Chen. Tēnā koutou katoa, it's great to be here, um, especially in recognition of um, Te Reo um, Māori Language Week, so I just want to give a little bit of um, pepeha. So, ko rangi toto te manga, ko pupuki te roto, no China aho, ko Robert Xichin ra raua, ko Yenguo Otu Matua, ko Nacy Chen Toku Inga, no rira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So, obviously I'm still a student of Te Reo at the moment, but it's a great pleasure to join everyone um, virtually, also and online, and to be here with all my fellow candidates and also with uh, um, HYC as well. So, like I said, my name's Nacy Chen and I arrived in um, beautiful Aotearoa, New Zealand at the age of five with my parents. My parents are both uh, medical doctors in China, and then we settled in New Zealand in search of a better life because my parents wanted you know, more work-life balance and this is exactly what we found in New Zealand. I grew up here, um, went to school here and then went to uni studying law and arts. And it was during uni that when I joined the New Zealand Chinese Students Association, I realised there was a lot of issues in our um, community right now that are really, really unfair. And a particular issue that caught my attention was the safety of international students' well-being. And so we were able to get a lot of movement and a lot of changes on that. So currently I'm on the board of Foundation North, also on the board of APO, and I run my own HR and employment law employment law consulting business. Um, it's a real pleasure and I think for me through those um, different organisations I'm able to actually really explore what New Zealand is all about and to reach into different places of New Zealand. I'm really, really passionate about youth voices to get them onto boards and to and better New Zealand. Well done, Nancy. We'll now go on to Christopher Luxon. Inga mana, inga reo, inga roranga tera ma, a tena koutou, tena koutou, tena koutou katoa. Uh, well, kia ora, good evening everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you here virtually. Uh, can I also say thank you to the Howick Youth Council for organising the event this evening? And can I also just acknowledge my fellow candidates? It's great to be on a shared stage with them as well. Uh, for me, I was born in Christchurch. I came up to Auckland as a youngster. I went to Star of the Sea, Cockle Bay Primary, Howick Intermediate, St Kent's, Howick College. I ended up going back to Christchurch, finishing high school, going on to University of Canterbury, doing a Masters of Commerce and Business Administration. And then I joined one of the world's largest companies, Unilever, uh, which sells everything from Ben and Jerry's ice cream through to Dove Soap. And I spent 16 of my 18 years living in Sydney, London, Chicago, Toronto and New York. 
I came back in 2011 to be the CEO of Air New Zealand and that was a great experience working in that company for eight years. It's a very special company to New Zealand and you start to understand more of the New Zealand agenda uh, and issues that we're dealing with. On the personal front, uh, I met my wife Amanda when I was 15. We started dating at 19, we were married at 23, we have two adult children uh, and we're very passionate about modern slavery and anti-sex trafficking and so we do a lot of work uh, throughout the world in that space uh, with some friends and family. I'm running because I think uh, New Zealand's a great place, we've got a great future ahead of us but we've also got challenges and opportunities before us and I think I come with a skill set around strategic thinking uh, and knowing how to get things done through, with and for people that's actually useful for moving the country forward. Thanks. Thank you and now on to Damien Smith. Uh, good evening everyone at home and um, thank you to the committee and to the fellow candidates uh, for this opportunity this evening. Um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. Uh, I've been down under um, since 1996 um, in Sydney and in Auckland and Auckland um, since 2002. And it's my pleasure to be, be selected by the Act Party of New Zealand by David Seymour as our leader, who you may know from Dancing with the Stars, who's uh, <laughs> uh, not a great dancer, but a great leader, um, <laughs> as, as you would see in the polls. Um, and so we're passionate about uh, making sure young people don't get emburdened with debt. Um, I have a, bi a business banking background with ASB and Macquarie Bank, and a management consultancy background. And so our mission is to help jumpstart the economy post-COVID, control the debt by reducing taxes. Um, at, at the moment, there's $180 billion worth of debt that's been racked up by this government, which will have to be paid back, which means that, unfortunately, you and I will have to do that job together. And so there's a very serious um, couple of years ahead for us in New Zealand. But as, as uh, Christopher said, there are opportunities to, um, to, to kick New Zealand on. The other thing that I think we want to um, get across to the public is that we're a young party. Um, we want to build it out. We've got 52 MPs around um, the country standing, and over the next 20, 30 years, Act's going to be a very exciting place for you to consider. Thanks, everyone. Uh, if you've just joined us, make sure you join Zetings at youth.org.nz slash HYC to be able to interact with the kit. Uh, the uh, forum and submit any questions that you have uh, tonight. There's been a public spotlight on the candidates running for the Botany electorate, and some have gained some local and national attention as well as criticism. Before we get into the topic-specific questions tonight, we want to give candidates a chance to directly respond to some of this and explain why they're going to be the best advocate for the interests of Botany residents. Uh, each candidate will have a question, and you'll get 90 seconds total as well to answer this. Uh, we're going to go in reverse order, so uh, starting with Damien. Uh, so Damien, your profile on the ACT Party website says you live in Ōrake, which means there are questions as to your prior involvement in this local community. What makes you the best advocate for the residents of Botany? Well, um, Christopher and I were talking earlier about coming here on an early New Zealand plane um, as an immigrant to uh, New Zealand. And um, I've got a wonderful daughter, who, um, and um, she's, she's a young person like yourselves. Um, in terms of botany, um, it was the first place I actually touched down on after coming from the airport. And at the time, the Botany Town Centre was, um, you know, in its birth, and it's great to see it making a comeback. Um, but I've always had a passion for this region, and I've always had a passion for East Auckland. And it's been left behind in terms of transport issues. It's been left behind in terms of um, major infrastructure that the rest of Auckland City has benefited from. So I'd love to be able to contribute to that, um, whether as a, a list MP or a candidate MP. So to me, uh, botany is the first place to find home, and um, I'd, like to, I'd like to keep it home. Thanks, Damien. Uh, Chris next. Uh, so as someone who hasn't lived in the area recently, there have been also questions as to your prior involvement and connection to the local community. Additionally, media commentators have speculated that the reason you're involved in politics is your future leadership ambitions, rather than necessarily being a local representative. What makes you the best representative and advocate for the interests of botany residents? Yeah, well, look, I've always wanted to come into politics, and I've always wanted to think I'd run in botany here. And the reason is that I think you've got to have an emotional attachment to the place that you're running in. And because I grew up here and I spent a lot of my childhood, I went to secondary, primary and intermediate schools in this area, 
uh, and lived here well. I have family that live here. I have a lot of friends that live here. Um, is a real reason for why I'm attached to here. And Botany is a really special place. And I can say that having grown up here, I think it served me incredibly well uh, to be able to go out into the world and to go do what I did uh, over that period of time. So for me, um, yeah, and the transition from, from, from work into politics or business into politics is um, a big transition. But actually, there's a lot of skills that are very similar in terms of how you get things done. And really, that's a big part of the motivation for, for why I want to run here. Botany is a special place. It's the new New Zealand here. Over 50% of people were born overseas. It's the most diverse electorate in the country. If we can work out the new New Zealand that's going to emerge in 2040 here in Botany, that's a really good thing. Um, you know, and the people, whether you've been here 40 years in Howick Cockle Bay or whether you've been here four years in Flatbush, are all united by ambition, aspiration. They want to get ahead for themselves, their family uh, and their community. And that's something that, you know, those are values that I believe are National Party values, but are certainly, you know, my values as well. Thanks, Chris. And uh, finally, Nacy. There were also questions for you to, uh, too, as your, to your prior involvement in the local community, having contested at the 2017 election the East Coast Bays electorate. You've also been cited by a researcher of having ties to groups which are associated with the Chinese government's alleged push to influence overseas politics. What makes you the best advocate for the interests of Botany residents? Look, I think um, I'll start with Botany, why I chose Botany, because in Botany there's 33.5% of Chinese residents living in this electorate. Um, not only do I speak fluent Mandarin, but also for me I think it's about recognising the diversity within our electorate. So not only for the Chinese community, but you know our, our Pacifica community down in Clover Park and every other community around the whole entire electorate, I hope to be a representative of everyone. But also just to bring in that young person um, perspective as well to everything, because like you guys did mention, that Botany is a, is a really, really young electorate. There's lots and lots of young families around here, and I hope to represent the voice of the next generation and to look at how we develop Botany in a new way. Now, for me, in terms of all of the allegations or any of that, look, um, I came to New Zealand when I was five. I've grown up and spent my whole entire life here in um, New Zealand since then. Um, I have absolutely no problem in calling New Zealand home, and I also see myself and my allegiance of becoming a New Zealand parliament, you know, an MP in New Zealand parliament, and that is my top priority. I don't think I need to comment any further about that. Uh, thanks to all the candidates there. Uh, I know some of those are tough questions, but, um, you know, I think. It's very clear to us, I think, that all candidates are very committed to representing the people and the interests of those who live in Botany. Uh, I'll hand over to Denitza as we move into the policy section of tonight with some key topics. Cool. So we have seven topics tonight, each chosen for their relevance to East Auckland youth and the wider Botany community. Candidates have not been given a full list of topics or questions before tonight. You, um, you, the audience, will be able to decide the order that we speak about these topics by voting on a poll through Zetings on your devices. So the topics that we'll be covering tonight are health and well-being, climate and the environment, enterprise and COVID-19, transport, housing, education, and the upcoming two referendums. Uh, looks like we've just hit our first uh, technical difficulty of the night. Uh, I can't actually find the poll uh, which we were going to survey you with. Uh, so we're going to uh, find that poll, but in the meantime, we'll start with the uh, first topic selection of that list, health and well-being. Okay, so the first uh, question that's going to the audience is, which of the four aspects of haora, or holistic well-being, needs the most additional support for the people of Botany? One, uh, taha tanana, physical well-being, uh, taha hingagaro, mental and emotional well-being, taha whanau, social well-being, or taha wairua, wai wai spiritual well-being? We've got a strong uh, contender here with Taha Hinganaro coming first um, for our mental and emotional well-being. Social well-being is not far behind. Great. Well, what we're going to do uh, is move on to our first question. Uh, and I think it's really relevant here, I think, talking about mental and emotional well-being. Uh, our first question reads as follows. A recently released report by UNICEF using data from 2015 to 2019 finds New Zealand children have poor rates of obesity and mental health outcomes driven by inequality and poverty. How will your party's policies address these issues and give each child in Aotearoa, no matter their circumstances, a fair go when it comes to their well-being and health? 
Uh, for this one, why don't we start in the middle with Damien? Thank you. Um, one of ACT's policies is to invest in a, an agency that um, specialises in social well-being and mental health and addiction. And we do think there is a massive problem in New Zealand um, all across the country in terms of how this is being managed and the resources that are going against that. One of the, one of the key aspects that we find is that the physical aspects of dietary needs, sugar intake, um, general exercise and performance is, has a direct correlation with mental health and well-being. And we want to give everybody the opportunity to get specialised counselling for that. We, our agency will actually sit and reallocate the resources that um, we will dedicate to the space. One of, one of the key aspects of health and well-being is, is to get educated and get yourself up into a system where you aspire to your own values and you're independent. So, you know, that's a very core centre of our, our policy. Uh, thanks, Damien and Chris. Um, well, look, what I'd say is that, you know, from a National Party perspective, we believe that a targeted approach is actually really good, and we call that the social investment model. And what we mean by that is by the time, you know, some kids have reached 14 in New Zealand, we've actually spent a million dollars on them. They're suffering from a whole range of deprivation illnesses. And actually, either we're serious about solving that, or we're just going to continue to talk about it. And the way to solve it is to use data and insights and actually to make powerful interventions in people's lives and then do it early so that we actually can change the course of their life over the long term. Without doubt, the biggest issue I see, my mother's a psychotherapist and I see mental health as the number one issue within New Zealand. It's been second class in terms of our health needs for th over 30 years. It's been chronically underfunded and we really need to step change that. When you look at suicide alone, it's a major, it's an embarrassment uh, when we sit third in the world uh, on that metric. So uh, we've got a lot to do uh, around trying to make uh, big interventions with people earlier uh, around mental health and spend more money getting more frontline services to them. Thanks Chris and finally Nacy. I think for someone's mental health and a child's development, the first thing we've got to start with is um, in their parent, when they're just born. So by increasing the parental leave um, period as well, I think that's something I'm extremely proud that our party was able to do. And so that there is more time for the mum and the baby to bond. And so that the child is actually, there's statistics showing that the child does way better well um, later in life as well. But also obviously Labour, we've, we've campaigned on the fact that we will increase a lot of resources to mental health and we have. So we've provided 300,000 extra support to all of these young people so that they get a mental health nurse in their schools, so they get the support of frontline mental health staff in their schools. And that is really, really important. Obviously, we've made GP visits cheaper uh, for almost 600,000 Kiwis in New Zealand, and we will continue to fund those frontline health workers and to put money into our schools and our hospitals so that we can really help those who are really at risk. Thanks everyone. Uh, in the next question, uh, we'll be discussing some content about youth suicide. If during the following discussion you feel you may need to speak to someone, uh, there's a range of helplines on the screen you can contact. And I know some candidates have already spoken about this, but this is a chance to elaborate a little bit further. Uh, according to YouthLine's 2019 annual report, the last decade has seen a 29% increase in youth suicide rates, with New Zealand having one of the highest youth suicide rates in the OECD. If elected, how will you respond to this issue of improving mental health of youth in our local electorate? Uh, and sorry, uh, Nacy. So like I said before, we will continue to roll out all of our um, support to mental health frontline workers, but also it's about, um, you know, our all the mental health facilities around New Zealand as well, not just in schools, but in different um, NGOs and different community organisations. But also I think it's first of all to shine insight onto it and to actually lead a, a government that actually cares about it. And it's our Prime Minister, Jacinda, that kept saying that we need to actually really show kindness to those youth in our communities. And that's what I think we need to show, that's what we show, where we show the difference. And it's to start by caring and it's start by actually acknowledging that we have this problem and to wrap our whole community's arms around these people, the youth who are at risk. I personally do also believe that we need a whole community response. It's not just about our frontline workers, but also about having a whole community around these youth. And it's about providing mentorship. It's all of that so that we can really support a young person, an at-risk young person, to do better in life. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, suicide, we have doubled the amounts 
suicides in this country, over 650 than what we have on road deaths. Um, I think suicide amongst the rural community is actually up 17% against the urban community. It's down 7%. It's the third worst in the world. So it is a major, major problem for us. Um, it does start with actually making understanding about what drives lifelong mental illness uh, and health issues. And when you look at it, 50% of people who struggle with lifelong mental health issues have been identified that before 14, 75% before the age of 25. And so we need to work in making sure we are putting firstly a lot more money at this problem. We need to make sure that we're investing in frontline services and workforce. We have a cross-party approach already. We have a zero suicides approach that all of us have signed up for as parties in Parliament trying to work on this because it has to last beyond just three-year terms where governments may change. And I think the importance of actually hearing from people with lived experience, and that's where you as young people come in. You have less stigma, you're more available to seek help, and we'd love to hear from you what you think we're falling short of uh, here in Botany would be great. And finally, Damien. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think this is the deep, dark secret that uh, New Zealand has to address. Um, you know, we talk to the agencies and they say under this government the money has been allocated, but the process of getting the money to the workers and getting it directionalized to help young people is an absolute disaster. So what we need to do is actually be really honest about how we allocate the resources to that and to set up agencies that aren't bureaucracies, but actually are caring, frontline, and also prevent, present a positive attitude to young people about what they can do with their life in New Zealand and what they can do internationally. And again, you know, we really need to be honest about this now and have that proper conversation. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, we're now going to move on to the ranking. Uh, our technical team has uh, been excellent in being able to get this ready for us uh, while candidates have been speaking. So uh, what you see on the screen is you'll see uh, six topics, referendums, education, enterprise and COVID-19, transport, housing, uh, climate and the environment. And what we're asking those of you watching at home to do is to rank uh, these questions in the order that you uh, want to do them in and that will help inform the order in which we ask these questions tonight. starting to see some answers. Education is the top choice right now. And sorry, just for referendums, so I will be covering both the canna uh, legalizing cannabis referendum and the euthanasia referendum as well. Candidates, what, is, what would your first pick for our topics tonight be? Um, sorry. I would probably love to talk about housing first. As a young person, first of all, I'll just put on record, I can't afford to buy my own house at the moment, so <laughs> <laughs> something love to talk about. Um, for me, it's all about the economy, this election. You know, we have to work out how we're going to go forward so we've got the cash to invest in the things we want to invest in. Damien, any first picks? Yeah, I'd like to talk about um, enterprise and COVID-19 and our, our recovery about how we jumpstart the New Zealand economy. Awesome. So according to our audience, our top topic tonight is transport, which will be followed by education, enterprise and COVID-19, referendums, housing, and finally climate and the environment. So we'll now get started with our next topic, transport. So we'll start off with another audience poll. How do you feel about the cost of public transport in Auckland? So our options are it should be free for everyone, should be cheaper, it's affordable, or it should be more expensive. And candidates, while the audience is asking, do you want to express just a short opinion? Should be cheaper. <laughs> yeah, should be more comprehensive. It, it, yeah, it should be more comprehensive and integrative. But also, we have to realise that um, Auckland Council has had a long history of underinvestment in certain areas, in this, this, this area especially. Um, so even though they're in massive debt problems at the moment, we need the release of that long-term funding to make sure that botany is serviced well. If you want to get to university from botany, it's just a nightmare, right? And if you want to get around the roads, it's a nightmare. So, you know, we've got to find an integrated solution there. And I don't think Auckland, Auckland Transport has paid enough attention to this area. Sorry, we're just having a slight technical difficulty. Um, I'm just going to check with our technical team uh, what's, uh, whether we need to just take a pause. Okay, we're just going to take a quick two-minute break just so they can sort out uh, the Wi-Fi issues. Um, <laughs> the joys of running a, uh, a live stream uh, forum. Uh, I think the broadcast is still live, but so, so Mike's alive. But yeah, thanks everyone. Cool. Uh, 
our apologies for that. Uh, we just had a dropout from our uh, 4G data provider. Um, but we're glad to be with you, and we're glad that uh, you're still watching. Okay, so uh, where we were was we were looking at the cost of public transport in Auckland, and 75% of candidates sh think it should audience? be cheaper. I'm uh, sorry, excuse me. 75% uh, uh, of the audience thought it should be cheaper. So let's go on to the first question. So our first question for the candidates tonight about transport concerns Auckland Transport's top pri one of Auckland Transport's top priorities being to get people walking, cycling or taking public transport, aiming to match London's ambitions of 80% of journeys being done this way. With this in mind, how urgently do you believe that Aucklanders need to get out of cars? We'll start with Chris. This is a big issue, right? And when you look at other great you know, cities like New Zealand or countries like New Zealand, like Denmark, have a similar sized city in Copenhagen, um, you know, they've got 80% of their people out using public transport. We've had chronic underinvestment. Just take our Eastern Busway out this way that's supposed to take you from 40 minutes from Botany into Britomart uh, through two modes of transport. And then when you think about how we do our planning, you know, we go build a place like Flatbush and we don't have arterial transport routes that can bring people out of there onto main circuit. So we've got some big investment to do. Um, um, on upgrading our transport system big time across, the, across New Zealand. That's why us as a national party, we want to spend $31 billion upgrading the Upper North Island uh, transport plan, and that means linking Whangarei ultimately with Auckland, with Hamilton, with Tauranga, and making sure that we've got all the modes of transport we need to start to get us connecting better uh, between those regions, but within Auckland City as well. Awesome. We'll go to Damien next. Yeah, well, the chronic underinvestment has been achieved by decisions by committee and that's one of the reasons the Westminster model doesn't quite suit this type of decision making. Um, what ACT wants to do is have an independent infrastructure um, body that takes the politics out of this local level and uh, at national level and really uh, focused on value for money for New Zealanders. So if you, if you want to get a cheaper efficient transport uh, done in a planned way then we do need to use the best in class around the world but we also need to finance it properly. And this is a great environment for doing that. And we should take this opportunity to fast track, as Chris said, a lot of projects. But we have to spend properly. We have to actually not um, spend with largesse that's been used in the Provincial Growth Fund, um, used on projects that don't have a national significance. Thanks for your answer. We'll now go to Nacy. Look, I think public transport is really, really important, especially for young people who don't have cars. And I, so I, first of all, I want to say, like, I'm a really big trains person. Trains are my thing. Um, and so I've been really, really excited that we finally got um, the Tuia. So that's the um, Hamilton to Auckland train ready on the tracks right now. It's there, sitting there. So I can't wait to drive down to, Welling, uh, to, to Hamilton once we're allowed out of Auckland um, to, to go there and have a look at that. But also, obviously, we've, we've talked about light rail. And I think that's something that we just got to spend a little bit more time with not giving up on that and let's keep doing that and keep going with that but obviously in this COVID situation Labour has already um, set aside 700 million to invest on all of our walkways our cycle paths and I think it's about integrating all different modes of transport including um, rapid transport from Botany to the airport as well and it's to integrate every single system together so that it works in one comprehensive um, way and so that we can always be able to have that choice to not use our cars again. One of the questions we had from an audience member last night was around how do we actually get the transport built? I know many of your parties have released announcements on infrastructure policy and there have been lots of commitments made, but how do we speed up the process of getting that stuff built? And look, Chris, you look raring to go there. Yeah, I'm really hot on this because actually when you go study other five million people countries on earth, they've got this worked out, right? And we think what we do in New Zealand is really great, but it turns out it's only good. And if you think about it, 2005, we started this conversation on an Eastern busway. It's a 7.5 kilometer busway from Botany to Pamua. It's not sending men to the moon. It's not building a bridge from Copenhagen to Malmo. It's not building a, a terminal or a new airport airport in, in Singapore and yet we're going to finish that project in 2025. We spent four years, the last four years doing consenting just for the bit from Pam Muir to Pakaranga and it's only in the last year that we started building and we're going to build again next year. So by 2021 we would have finished stage one of a five stage project. In the intervening period, we've got 130,000 people living here, bigger than Dunedin, bigger than Tauranga, and we've got another 30,000 coming by 2030. So you just know by the time this thing's built, it's not there. So we have to get much better at a master plan of projects through an infrastructure commission. We have to finance them through public-private enterprise if we have to. We have to do RMA reform big time, and we have to work out whether we're just good at putting cones out rather than getting things done uh, and actually get some capability to do it. 
Thanks, thanks, Chris. Well, Nacy, what do you have to say to that? I think audience are going to be, be a little bit baffled that I'm actually going to agree a lot with Chris on a lot of these things. First of all, I'm going to agree with him that for the last nine um, nine years pre previous to Labour coming to government, that there has been a huge underfunding of public transport. And I'm going to agree with him that we do need a master plan and a vision for New Zealand in terms of our public transport and to be bold and to actually implement those plans. And that is exactly what Labour has been doing. We have a vision and we're bold in trying to step outside of the box and try new things and to say, hang on, this might not work, let's go another way. And we were going to keep trying. And obviously in this COVID situation, we've recognised the opportunity to reset our country in a new way by creating jobs to, um, to not only to stimulate our um, economy, but also to use those job opportunities, to use the money that we've borrowed to actually rebuild New Zealand into a better New Zealand. Thanks, Stacey. And finally, Damien. All the young people I know, the first thing they want to do is get driving lessons and get a car and get around. And obviously there's a balance between that and public transport. And one of the things that the political cycle does not allow us to do in three years is plan this properly. And we need to actually all get together as parties and go, right, let's take the politics out of public transport. Let's make it as cost effective for young people as possible to go and do their work or their university um, or see their parents or see their friends or go to an iClub, just simple things. And so really we've got to you know, just really start again with regards to Auckland's infrastructure. Somebody once described Auckland to me as seven areas with a sewerage system running underneath it. Um, and that's, that's sort of, you know, we need to get beyond all that thinking. And so let's, let's have a look at um, how we budget and finance this. Awesome, thank you for those answers. We'll now move on to our next category of the night, education. So we'll start off with another audience poll. Do you support the fees-free policy? Where do, oh, I'm sure we can guess where our candidates sit, but do they want to give us a brief overview? Chris? Uh, I don't because it just supports middle class and wealthy students. Damien, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm of that view too, but it's, uh, as of today, it's, it's, it's been killed in a, in a way that uh, is quite cynical. So, um, you know, people who were offered that at the last election as a bribe, a lot of people voted on the basis of that, and now this government has, has taken that away um, because they're spending too much money in other areas and they can't afford this. And in this post-COVID world, we need to get smart about digital education we need to get smart about online learning now because that's what the, the new reality is. And we also need to build uh, skill sets for the industrial cool. age. And we'll just see what Nacy has to say And to also that. I think for the fees free as well, um, what worked really well and what we're actually continuing with that program is the apprenticeships and it's also the trades training. And so that's actually really, really important, especially now that we need more workers, we need more different trades people. That is what's going to drive our economy forward is if we, if we have the right skilled workers in our economy. So let's start with the people and let's train them well and give them a really good career path. Well, Chris, I know you didn't really get a bite of that question, so do you, wanna, uh, do you, want, do you have anything else to say? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the bottom line is, I remember talking this through with Jacinda Ardern when I was chairing her business advisory council. It was like, fees-free is a great project, but, you know, my kids don't need fees-free. I would sooner take that money and target it and put it towards people so that they can actually have access to education rather than just give it to middle-class and wealthy people to do it. Um, and so for me, um, I appreciate for a lot of students watching it, they, you know, they love the idea, that's really good. But we have some major challenges in this country, and the big thing that's hitting us is this fourth industrial revolution, and that is about automation, artificial intelligence, robotics. It is going to disrupt the future of work big time, and it's going to change the nature of the skills that we're going to need. It's going to take. It's going to have a lot of uh, potential unemployment. 54% uh, of people are going to need to be retrained and reskilled, and we're certainly going to need to think about how we don't get inequitable outcomes in terms of income uh, disparity between people. And that's really something we've got to focus on big time is around the future of work and the, and the digital skills that we're going to need to succeed uh, in a technology world. And if we do that right, we can make the country more competitive more productive and will create more jobs and higher value better jobs as a consequence so I want us to think about that as an opportunity to upgrade New Zealand rather than just um, and change our system as a result Awesome, so it's interesting to see that our audience does actually mostly support the views of our candidates tonight with 60% of our audience not being in favour of fees free We'll now move to our second question for education tonight The pandemic has highlighted existing inequalities in New Zealand's education system for example, some students had little access to technology to enable remote learning, and some students have not attended school since lockdown because they've had to work to support their families. 
How would your party's policies address these issues? We'll start with Damien. Yeah, I really feel for um, the young people in this COVID period. Um, I know my daughter is going under the stress of uh, trying to do online learning and, and do exams. And, um, you know, that's that's um, something we have to really, really get right. Sorry, we've just had an interruption to the live video again. Sorry. Cool. Sorry, I understand we're back. Sorry. So do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, let's start again. Um, yeah. This COVID uh, situation where we had this opportunity to get online learning right, it, there was so much variability amongst all the schools. There was no standard methodology ready to be rolled out. I think now it's, uh, it's come home to roost and um, we have to apologize to all the young people for the stress this has caused them in terms of their education. And hopefully the systems will make up for that. Act's policy in terms of education is to start off in a kid's two and give them $250,000 so their parents can decide where they want to put them, give them 30 grand or 40 grand when they get to university. And really throughout that whole s system, you have a choice of what provider you want to use and where you want to go. And um, we believe that's a fair and equitable way. The Green Party, the hypocrisy of killing um, the school program that you know charter schools that we had is, is not acceptable. So we can't play with people's education. Thanks for your answer. We'll now go to Nacy. Look, I think um, this COVID situation has really highlighted the inequality that exists within our country. And so I think that's, we. first of all, we just got to do better. So obviously we have rolled out um, a lot of support in terms of access to internet and also devices as well. I think that's really important. And we did act really fast in the first week of lockdown to start to roll out those devices to the children and the families who need it the most. And obviously we've done the TV education programs, one to um, specifically for our Māori students and one for all English speaking students. And so that was, all, there's no playbook for COVID. And look, I absolutely understand how frustrating it is. It's, it's even frustrating for all of us candidates who have the election dates moved as well. So I think definitely for everyone, I, I do recognize how hard this situation is. But I think what Labour has done obviously is to also recognize that NCEA um, qualifications are going to be really hard to attain. So we've made sure that that is adapting to this COVID situation as well. We've spoke early on to all of the, t with all of the tertiary education, so they've all moved their courses to online. So hope this is what we need to do is we need to, um, we need everyone to support each other and to adapt to this new, what we're going to call this new normal, but also to really provide the resources to those families who need it the most. Thanks. We'll now go to Christopher. Look, I think two things. One is that, you know, aren't we grateful that we've got the ultra fast brand, you know, broadband in place when you compare to Australia, which has got really spotty sort of reception. That was a great national investment under Stephen Joyce and John Key, and that served us very well through the COVID period. As I said before, we've got to continue to invest in that digital education to give our young people the skills to need with the world that's constantly evolving on them and the nature of work that will change. But the other thing is that we're talking, we've talked a lot about our schooling system and organised it through what we call deciles and actually using what we call an equity, equity index is probably the better way to look at it where you actually look at areas of social deprivation and other variables that are uh, impacting that family or that young person. And then as I said before, rather than universalism, which is just paying everybody the same amount of money, we target it and make powerful interventions in people's life and we upweight and up-resource early so that we can actually get the benefits and change the course of life as a consequence. Awesome, thank you. We'll now move on to our next category for tonight. This one, we have an extra question because it's such a hot topic. Enterprise and COVID-19. And the question we're asking the audience at home is, have you had a reduction in your income or lost your job due to COVID-19? Yes or no? Uh, just while we do that, uh, I just want to remind you that we are taking audience questions. You can ask those audience questions either by commenting on the Facebook page or by filling in uh, on the Zetings activity wall. I see we've actually got an audience question for this section as well, uh, so we'll be asking it there. A uh, bit of a different response tonight. Looks like 14% of people saying they have had a reduction and 86% not. So, um, yeah. Any responses from the candidates? Have you experienced a reduction in your income or lost your job since COVID-19? <laughs> Can I just say, I've been an unemployed candidate for almost 10 months. And so um, I've, I was unemployed before COVID and I'm still unemployed afterwards. But look, I mean, in all seriousness, this is a really tough issue and uh, people are doing it really tough and are going to do it harder going forward. So uh, it is something we need to spend a bit of time talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. And we'll, we will have some questions on that. Yeah. yeah, I'm a small business owner, so definitely I think business has dropped. And so that's really, really hard hitting. But, um, but I, what I'm seeing is also the resilience of New Zealanders as well. Um, I think um, we just get to have to get super real. Um, we're in a situation where this week we will be released with unemployment data and GDP data which will show that um, there's a lag uh, in terms of the impact of the COVID management system, and it's going to have a real impact on our economy, not just this last six months, but for the next potentially 18 months going forward. And we've, we've got to work a way out of this. And one of the strategies with ACT is to oh, put, put more money in your pocket by lo lowering taxes and creating proper jobs. And that's a partnership aspect. I hope the other parties will respect and work with us on. Cool. So we're just looking for brief answers to those. We've obviously got the longer questions where you get a chance to talk there, Damien. So uh, we're going to move to our first question. Uh, the International Labour Organization says youth may be hit the hardest by the pandemic's economic consequences with potential long-term effects because young people tend to work in more precarious roles. How will your party's policies specifically support young people in a post-COVID economy? Nacy. I think training is really, really, really important. And so it's to train our young people with the skills and the um, and the knowledge in this post-COVID um, world. And I think definitely for me, obviously, it's to, in the digital world, but also, also to have the skills to rebuild our economy. Look, I know infrastructure might sound really boring, but that is exactly what we're needing in this country after nine years of underfunding it. And so that's where our young people will have those opportunities to see themselves but also I think um, as we see the Labour's, Labor's also for our wage subsidy program we've also cushioned you know 1.7 million people's jobs from being lost um, during the worst part of the um, pandemic as well and so it's about actually getting help to those who need it the most and also just to sustain that um, and as they become uh, more resilient and as they're able to readjust or maybe to um, reposition themselves so for young people I believe in New Zealand young people I think we're really really resilient we're creating Creative. I mean, Trade Me started in a um, garage, so we might be seeing more of these come through in a pandemic time and in a recession time, and I think we have to be creative. Thanks, Stacey. Chris? Um, look, I mean, what I'd say is the economy is not dry or abstract. It's not just statistics and boring GDP. It's actually about people, and it's about real people and their livelihoods. And so you see that out in East Tamaki here. We have 2,000 businesses in East Tamaki, $3.5 billion, 30,000 people employed. And when I'm sure all of us are talking to you know small business owners. It's incredibly tough. What I want to say is the reality is this. The Reserve Bank says this will be the worst recession in 160 years. We have 200,000 people on unemployment. We could have another 200 to 400,000 in the next 12 months. Uh, and you are right. Young people are more impacted than anyone else. In the last two years alone, under 25s on job seeker support has doubled. Uh, and so as a consequence, we've really got to do the job right there. So I, I just say to as you as young people, engage with the economy. Don't make it, just don't think it's maths and dry and boring and left brain and hard. It is actually really important you do that. We've got to support small business. We've got to do quality infrastructure. We've got to have good economic fiscal management, not waste money on stuff that's not nice to do, not must do. We've got to improve our productivity so we can get higher wages and salaries. And we've got to invest in those skills and for the future of work. And thanks, Damien, uh, young people in a post-COVID economy. Yeah, we've got, um, we've got a lot of work to do um, in Wellington, and we've got to provide the frameworks that allow you to thrive. And one of those is putting more money in your pocket. If you're earning um, under 70,000, we're going to flatten the tax rate, and that's going to be real dollars for you to apply wherever you want to apply or to save. And we're going to try and reduce all the debt burden and get back into a surplus as fast as we can. And I've got a five-point plan, which is on our website, act.org.nz, which will show you how we're going to reduce taxes and we're going to actually not have any impact on education or healthcare. And so we're coming at it from an angle where we need to pull our belt in and we need to actually work hard across the nation, young people, people our age, to, to make a, a success of New Zealand. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Uh, while we do encourage your audience participation, uh, we do encourage you to be respectful on the Facebook page. Uh, we've already given uh, our candidates an opportunity to address some of those concerns as well tonight. Okay, uh, we're going to go, uh, and this is a topic I think we've already touched on, but small businesses are struggling in the wake of COVID-19, including many local businesses in Howick, East Hamaki and Highbrook. Uh, so an opportunity to talk about your party's policies. And um, Chris, you had some comments there initially. Do you want to uh, finish those off? Well, look, I think, you know, it's all about small business, right? 97% of all our business activity is small business. 70% of people work in small businesses. And so 
it's not going to be ministers doing make work projects that's going to create jobs. It's actually going to be private enterprise actually moving this, uh, us out of this, uh, this hole that we're in. And so things like practical things, really practical things. When I go out and talk, and I spend probably every day I'm spending to three or four businesses across Botany. And you know, it's things like tax cost and compliance that we can do some things around what we call amortization schedules, depreciation schedules, those sorts of things. They're very dry and boring, but these are really practical things if you're a, a person with a business. There are some things around employment law that we could change that encourages people to take on somebody, but equally if it's not going to work out that they can move them on and actually uh, hire somebody else and get what we call labour market flexibility in there. And then I think there's some things around red tape about cash flow, making sure that governments pay bills within seven days, big companies pay their bills within you know two weeks, uh, and we can do that through something called e-invoicing. So there's some real practical things. You've got to wake up each day as an MP deciding, I can unblock this thing and get this country moving. Thanks, Anne. And as as a government during this whole entire pandemic, I think it's really, really, um, for me, I think it was really, really good to actually have uh, Labor's policies being those ones, especially for the tax relief. And that has really, really helped small businesses like my own that, you know, up to our interest free loans are really, really good. And also just also the tax chargebacks. And I think that's been just getting that extra cash flow into those businesses to help and obviously the wage subsidy scheme to help people not to lay off them at the worst time during our lockdown but to actually keep them on so that they're ready to go once we've reopened up our economy and I think those are the small things that we know that Labour has done that has really really helped small businesses through this and actually look we're continuing our business loans and we're, we're looking at other ways of supporting small businesses so that we can actually make sure we build an economy for the future. Damien. <laughs> well, it's um, it's it's a situation in in botany where, just as an example, last weekend, the COVID tent went up. Nobody used it. Um, it it killed a whole trading weekend of business. Uh, Father's Day was obliterated, which is how people earn money in cafes and shops and bars. And so, you know, these are structural changes that need to we need to plan now to get out of this and. You know, the, the government's gone through its COVID plan and we've given it six months of opportunity to do that. Now we need to actually, um, you know, pay the piper and we need to actually help small businesses um, in this area to thrive again. Now, that's not easy when you can't come out. And so we need to reapproach this and really think through now what is the next stage? Thanks. And now we're going to give you a chance to talk about the COVID-19 recovery. Uh, the government has responded to COVID-19 with the view that the best economic response is a strong health response. If your party was in government, is there, or, you know, <laughs> is there anything you would do differently to respond to COVID-19? And Damien, you, you were starting to get some comments there, weren't you? Yeah, um, well look, the ACT Party believes in using technology and I think uh, if we, the numbers on the app speak for themselves in terms of downloads, but actually of the 1.8 million people using that app, it's been absolutely fundamentally useless to to tracking and tracing what has been going on. So as part of our smarter economy strategy, at the borders, we need to invest money. So ACT would have invested 300 million there over the smart infrastructure system at the border. That would have been um, digitally digitized inside the economy. And so we wouldn't have had all these running around trying to find things. Now, it's, it's not an easy job and the medical practitioners have had to do a great scramble to get there. But in the future now, we need to actually build a smart economy and we need to use tracking and tracing in a way that um, is going to help all our healthcare, not just COVID. Thanks. And uh, why don't we go to Chris there? And uh, someone has also anonymously asked the same question about what would National have done differently? Yeah, look, um, I think all of New Zealand, the five million of us, actually did incredibly well. There was very good compliance. Um, people followed the rules. I don't think there's much use looking out the back windscreen mirror, sort of talking about what we might have done differently. That's all quibbles, uh, to be brutally honest. It's all about what we're going to do going forward because um, we can be in a bit of a sugar coma at the moment, not quite understanding what's about to hit us. And so job number one is to make sure that there's a ring of um, an iron ring of defence around the border uh, and there's lots of things that we can do to continuously improve what we're doing there uh, and we had some ideas around that, around our border policy, you know, one agency that actually coordinates the government response, a number of tactical things. And then once you've got a really strong wall of defence, then you can actually put a, you know, a drawbridge in place and you can actually start to think about how you open the economy up. There is no doubt about it, this thing is going to have waves and it's going to keep coming through us uh, as global waves and we're going to have to learn to live with it and actually work out how we keep people safe but also how we protect livelihoods as well. 
Thanks, Chris. A strong health response. Nacy. I think that's absolutely exactly what it needs to be because like um, I think everyone has experienced, it's really important that we actually look after the well-being of our people and the health of our well uh, of our people first. But look, now that we are looking at what our future plan is, Labour has a five-point plan in order to set up our economy for the better. And look, we, we need to create more jobs in New Zealand. That's the first thing and that's all about training our young people to meet the demands of the market and to make sure our economy is ready and also to invest in our young people. And also, obviously, Obviously, to prepare for the future, and that includes, you know, cleaning up our waterways so that our environment is ready once we open the doors to tourism again. And also, it's about, you know, um, all of our trade agreements that actually has been going on in the background during this whole lockdown. And also, it's about, you know, uh, our infrastructure building. It's just really, really important to make sure that we are ready to open up the economy again. Okay, cool. Uh, we're now going to go to an audience question, uh, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll give all candidates a chance to comment, but it reads, uh, Hi, by Mike. Can you ask Chris how much money National wants to spend relative to Labour's spend for the COVID-19 recovery? How much debt should New Zealand take on to deal with the pandemic response? Yeah, well, what I'll tell you is $250 billion, which is kind of where we're heading, is actually way too much debt, and it's driving too much wasteful spending. That's the reality of it. So there's no doubt about it. We have to spend money. It's not a time for austerity, but we certainly don't need to spend money in a wasteful way. I would put it to you really frankly. $360 million for a bike path on the Harbour Bridge is a lovely idea when times are great, but at the moment when things aren't great, you've got to focus that money on, on the things that we must do rather than what we'd like to do. Uh, so for us, um, we think we need to grow the economy and actually focus on actually growing the economy faster. We'd actually spend a slightly less than what uh, what the government would spend, uh, and then we want to actually sort of suspend some of our, uh, our superannuation payments, and that's the way we just run at a slower rate uh, and not build up as much debt. Damien, how much less would ACT spend? The money's been spent. Um, we, our objective would be to take this debt and, at a government level, get back to surplus as, as quickly as possible. And that would involve cutting bureaucracy, it would cutting, reducing the number of MPs in Parliament. It would also look at all the things like the DHBs, integrating them into one system, and um, to really get some efficiencies back out of um, the cost side of what the government has, has created. Now, that can be a joint process, or it can be an antagonistic process. We'd rather everybody work together on that and reduce debt for young people. Well, now, see, so you've heard the other views. Uh, what's Labour's spending? Look, I think it's, we're spending it in terms of on our people, then it becomes an investment rather than a spending, and I think that's really, really important. Look, at the end of the day, after all this borrowing, we are still one of the lowest countries in the OECD in terms of our actual debt. And so we're still aiming towards that 20% of GDP, um, and so that's really, really responsible spending. And Labour has actually been historically really good at keeping the books, and whether that was in Grant Robinson's days or in um, Sir Michael Callan's days as well um, as the finance minister. We've always been really, really responsi responsible phys uh, fiscally, and also we will spend it at times when we need it to invest. Thanks. That now brings us to our next topic of the referendums. So we've just got an info slide up right now on seatings about our first referendum tonight, the cannabis referendum. So our voters are being asked about... Our voters are being asked about a bill which aims to decriminalise and regulate the production, sale and consumption of cannabis. Only people aged over 20 could access cannabis and they could buy up to 14 grams of dried cannabis or its equivalent per day from licensed outlets. Only these licensed outlets could sell it and no online sales can take place. Cannabis can only be consumed on site of licensed outlets or in private residences and there would be a ban on the advertising of cannabis products although limited marketing would be allowed. The bill does not cover medical cannabis, hemp, driving while impaired, or workplace health and safety issues. It's important to note as well that this referendum is non-binding, so if more than 50% uh, of voters tick yes, then the next government will consider the results and Parliament will undertake its normal legislative procedures if the bill is introduced. So we've got an audience poll up right now. Um, do you agree with legalising cannabis for recreational use? Following this poll, we'll give the candidates a chance to respond as well. Oh, 
looking like a fairly even, well, it wasn't even split there. Uh, so 42% saying yes for cannabis. 50, well, <laughs> you can see it, it's 50-50 at the moment. Um, but, you know, what? let's go to the candidates. So we'll start off with Macy. If elected, are you in favour of the legalisation of cannabis for recreational use? Can I can I just adjust the question because it's a referendum, so your vote is just as important as mine. So so it doesn't matter whether I'm elected or not. I, yes, I will still be participating in the referendum, and um and obviously this is not um our party line, party policy line, but personally, yes, I will be supporting it. Also, awesome. we'll go to Damien next. Yeah, the the act's policy is not to. Um criminalize this area. Um, but I'd just like to point out a few things. One is that um, it, it, the, the cannabis uh, quantities that people are talking about are four times stronger than what those politicians down in Wellington used to peep uh, in, in their head is. Um, so I, I've got some reservations just ab about the impact of this on young people, um, the, the consequences around jobs, um, being able to conduct a job because there's lots of drug testing that goes on in work now. Um, and if you can't perform uh, at the start of the week, then that's that's an issue. Um, but you know we need to actually be quite stringent on this. And a lot of people associate this with medical cannabis, and it's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Um, that that that's a whole separate system. So um, yeah, we've got to be cautious, but it's up to the public. Awesome, and we'll go to Chris. Um, I'm against it for three reasons. The first is that when I left here in New Zealand, I was actually approached to run global cannabis companies uh, in California. And so um, I can tell you the reason why was because they wanted me to bring my Unilever marketing background in the same way I created products in the personal care category to do the same thing to drive consumption of marijuana products. Um, so it is about increasing consumption. Secondarily, um, as a CEO of Air New Zealand, I can tell you it's really hard to test for marijuana. It's a three-week sort of test in your bloodstream versus alcohol, which is a two-day two, two test. So I just think in a safety-sensitive industry, it's really hard to work out when a plane falls out of the sky, was that because you had someone impacted as an engineer or not? And the third thing I'd say, we've just spent a lot of time talking about mental health, poverty, addiction, and that combination with young people. I just don't want to write off a generation of great young New Zealanders uh, through, through legalising marijuana. So I'm strongly against it, and I know our party's completely against it too. Respond to Chris by is saying that the problem of marijuana right now is already in New Zealand and cannabis, and I think that's just really, really important that we recognise that it's not like this um, legislation is going to let in um, cannabis into New Zealand, but the problem's already there, and we've tried for tens of years, and you know, 80% of New Zealanders um, by the time they reach 25 would have already tried it. So, what are some of the ways to actually try and solve that problem? Chris, we'll give you. Yep. Yeah, well, the Bill report said that there will be an increase in total consumption. There's no doubt about that. And that's just natural because when you regulate it, you're going to invite companies to produce it. And companies' motivation will be to drive consumption and um, and to, to target and open up new niches with new products and uh, around that. And that's just the natural order of things. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to go to our next uh, question on referendum. Or so our next referendum is the euthanasia one. So do you support the End of Life Choice Act 2019 coming into force? So this act gives people with a terminal illness the option of requesting assisted dying. This is defined as a person's doctor or nurse practitioner giving them medication to, or the person themselves taking medication, to relieve their suffering by bringing on death. The proposed law could only apply to New Zealand citizens or permanent residents over the age of 18 who are suffering from a terminal illness which is likely to end their life within six months. The person would have to be undergoing a significant decline in their physical capability and be experiencing unbearable suffering that cannot be eased. The person would also have to be able to make an informed decision. The proposed law does not allow people to ask for assisted dying solely on the basis of mental distress, old age or disability. Once a patient has requested treatment of their own initiative, two medical practitioners must independently verify that the patient meets all the aforementioned criteria. And with this particular referendum, this one is binding, so if more than 50% of voters tick yes, the act will come into law. So we'll now go to an audience poll on this. Are you in favour of the End of Life Choice Act? And again, we'll give candidates a chance to uh, give their full answers in a uh, once we see what the audience says. Looks like we've got stronger opinions for this referendum, so far with about 70% of people not being in favour of it. So 
some change in the results, but we still got the majority of people being against the uh, against this act coming into force. So we'll now go to our candidates. Sorry. So right now we've got 53% of people, 50% of people in favour of the act, and 50% against. So we'll start off with Chris. Are you in favour of this referendum? Well, again, on this, unlike marijuana, we don't have a party position. It's a free will and free choice. Um, from my perspective, I'm against euthanasia because I just fundamentally think there's high risk around elder abuse and sort of the coercion protections for me uh, just mean if we lose one life through that not being followed, that's a big problem. So um, personally, I'm against it. Nacy, if elected, do you think assisted dying should be a choice and legalised under circumstances in New Zealand? Um, once again, not if I'm elected, your vote is just as valuable as mine and I, that's why I would encourage everyone to go out and vote, please. Um, but for me personally, I don't agree with it and I don't support it. The reason why is because I don't think right now our technology and our medical technology is up to the, script, um, up to the point where we can definitely say someone has six months to live. I think I have a problem with that threshold because um, I know a lot of miracles happen. Often people get told you have, you know, three months to live and then they live two years, four years. So I definitely think that's a, um, just right now with the medical technology that we have at the moment. And we'll go to Damien. Yeah, this is um, a bill that David Seymour has, um, has brought through and um, with the very um, best intentions, um, looking at how this operates around the world and to put a legal framework in place which allows people that choice and that, that is part of the Act policy, to be free to do that. Um, there's stringent checks and balances um, it's it's something where I've, I've seen my father die a very painful death, and um, that option was never there. So, um, you know, the party policy is, is to support this. And we've just got our helplines up on Z-Tings again, just because we are discussing some sensitive topics here. But we'll now be moving to our next topic tonight of housing. So we'll start with another audience poll. This one could produce some interesting results. Do you think the youth of East Auckland, currently aged under 25, under 24, will ever be able to buy a house? Nacy, we heard some comments from you along these I'm lines earlier. So I'm two years above that age. I still can't afford a house at the moment. <laughs> Give a yes, no there. You'll all get a chance to talk for more detail, Damien. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is New Zealand's other big problem. Um, you know, you're talking about income to... Um, debt ratios, they're just um, the highest in the world, uh, apart from two or three other cities. And we've got to change the resources. You'll, you'll get a second uh, to talk. Yeah, okay. Chris, what about yes, no? Or Sorry, uh, just, uh, do you think the youth of East Auckland, currently aged under 24, will ever be able to buy a house? Absolutely. Yep, got to believe in the Kiwi into, dream. into the mic, sorry. Absolutely. We have to believe in the Kiwi dream. Okay, cool. Well, that takes us into our first question. So, housing prices have been rising. It has been, put pr it has been putting pressure on many house hunters. In July this year, the average asking price was $1,088,250 in Auckland City. If elected, what would you do in regards to rising house prices? We'll start off with Chris. Yeah, look, this is a really big issue. We have a country the size of Japan and the UK, and yet we have very expensive housing. So we have plenty of space for 5 million people. Uh, and the real, there's two big challenges here. The major one is what we call the Resource Management Act. It's a piece of legislation formed in 1991. It's now 800 pages long. It's had 18 different amendments to it. And it really does two things not very well. And so we want to repeal that act, and we want to replace it with what we call an Environmental Standards Act, so we can make sure we've got really clear environmental protection and standards. And secondary, do an urban, uh, have what we call an Urban Planning Act. And that's been the major impediment for us to be able to get the supply. And that was proven with the Labour Kiwi Build policy. You know, the goal was to build 100,000 houses. They built 400 and something, I think, in, against the 16,000 first year term. And that just underscores, even for a government, let alone for private industry, it's really difficult to get things done through this RMA. And so it's a regulatory failure, not a market failure. And we'll next go to Nacy. Look, I think this is really um, a really, really complex issue that we definitely need to solve. And I think, um, first of all, we start off by banning foreign um, speculation. So first of all, our young people don't have to compete against really wealthy overseas um, buyers. But also it's about making everything more accessible. So obviously we've scrapped the need for consents around low risk buildings. So that's improvement. And we've just actually, um, I think we've just received the report of RMA that we need to, um, to definitely things to improve on and also their, um, their advice for us as well to look into the next cycle. But I think housing is just bigger than just affordability. It's for um, homeless people. And I think um, housing is really, really important that we start to tackle those problems and to tackle um, 
homelessness because that also leads into a lot of problems with mental health as well and a sense of community and look so I think we definitely need to catch people at, at the other end of um, the economy as well which people who can't afford houses no matter what the price is but also to put them into uh, transitional housing also into public housing as well that's all really important issues we need to talk about and we'll finish off this question with Damien yeah I think one of the big failures of uh, this coalition government. Um, one of the things that people have got to understand with the price of a house is that it's, for, it's the land that's the big problem. Um, it's where most of the expense sits and we end up building in the wrong places. Um, that's why we need to reform the Resource Management Act and the Unitary Plan. And then we've got to look at the life stages of people as well because you'll come through and you'll get together with someone and then you'll start a family. And some of the housing stock we're actually building People are going into it for first homes, but want to leave it to go out and um, expand. So money is cheap, but debt is expensive if you're on the wrong side of that value equation. So what we, do, we want to encourage people to, as Christopher said, build the Kiwi dream, but at the same time we want to actually manage efficiently the debt levels that people have uh, in, in relation to what they can service as a mortgage. Cool. Uh, we're just going to jump in with an audience question here from Facebook. Uh, what, we'll give everyone a chance to talk about it, but what is Chris's view on national selling state houses in the past and the lack of banning of foreign buyers, which has resulted in the current housing crisis? Yeah, look, a couple of things on that is, um, yes, there were some houses sold that were in areas where they, where they you know, wasn't going to be a good development area. There was other houses that were actually passed off to other social housing providers. Um, again, I, I'm not there to discuss the past. I wasn't part of the past. What I am part of is part of the future. There is real issues um, as we identified. You know, if you think about homelessness, I think there's, you know, we want to consider potentially a dollar, matching a dollar of homeless shelters. I think there's work that we've got to do around the rentals, um, and I think probably this government's tip the balance against landlords, which actually could blow back with higher rents, and rents have gone up $50 a week. And then I think there's things like rent to buy shared equity schemes that we need to introduce so that we get pathways and stepping stones for people, to, young people to be able to get on the housing ladder. Um, so there's work on the supply side, there's work on the demand side as well. Uh, Damien, state housing and foreign buyers. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, um, an eventful 10 years in terms of the, um, the amount of leverage that's been put into the system. Um, and cheap funding is fueling um, a fear of missing out. And so um, I think anybody that comes and um, wants to buy a property from an area like this, um, you need stability in your jobs. You need to be um, really thriving to, um, to do that. And in terms of the rest of the population that needs help, it's absolutely essential that state housing and uh, another form of living is, is provided. And that's, that's somewhere the, the government has to actually address again. And Nacy, what about Labour's view? I think Chris um, is sounding a little bit like a, a Labour candidate. So what he talked about rent to buy, so we've got our um, progressional um, home ownership scheme, which is about government owning the land and then young people slowly buying the house and buying the equity of the house on top and also slowly paying their way so that they have a segue into the housing market. And so that's something definitely, I think, really, really beneficial mm -hmm. for young people. But also, obviously, it's a, it's a supply and demand. So it's about making it easier, making a uh, job, there's more builders in the market. And so making that supply chain cheaper to build more affordable housing. And obviously, we're seeing lots of prefabricated housing coming to market. I'm really excited to be able to afford my first home very soon. Yeah, Chris, Chris, we'll give you just a moment there. Yeah, I was going to say, on, on the foreign buyer thing, I think you know it's one that becomes quite jingoistic and xenophobic pretty quickly. And the reality is when you do a you know surname search and decide that there's you know a lot of foreign buyers in the marketplace, I don't think that's really very cool. Um, but what I'd say to you is, like, if you want to open up foreign buyers to buy homes in excess of $5 million, that's not making houses unaffordable in New Zealand. That's a different part of the market. And those foreign investors that come and spend 5 to $10 million buying houses, they're going to, they're going to create a lot of jobs and they often end up investing other things in this economy and so if I look at Julian Robertson if I look at um, a whole bunch of overseas investors they've added a lot to the economy. Uh, Nacy, I'll give you a but moment to just respond. prior to I think when um, Labour banned they weren't buying the five million there was lots of people because oh, I'm Chinese so speaking of xenophobia um, I think definitely we see a lot of um, different uh, different foreign buyers coming into that and then buying those residential homes and then banking them and or, or either not even renting it so we see a lot of ghost homes coming up especially um, I used to live in North Shore and we see that a lot and so they'll come in it uh, come to New Zealand live in it for the say the summer holiday and then just leave it um, empty for the rest of the time and they're actually affordable residential homes. Cool, thanks for canvassing that issue. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, next prepared question. 
healthy, un un healthy home standards require rental properties to satisfy requirements around heating, insulation, ventilation, moisture and drought stopping. Do you think the policy goes too far, is about right, or does not go far enough? We'll go with Chris there. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm a big fan of making sure we don't have slum landlords. So I think a lot of the healthy home initiatives around insulation, heating have actually been very good. The, the challenge on the recent round of legislation is it's just tipped the balance too far the other way. So that if you have a tenant that, because you, know, you've got to understand, people have saved really hard. They've gone off and bought an investment property. They're renting it out. But now you've got a place where you just can't get rid of a bad tenant who's, got, who's causing, you know, social... Um, you know, disruption or, or is, you know, poor behaviour or whatever it is. And so I think we just probably got that balance wrong. And the consequence of that is that landlords will just up their rents and it becomes more expensive for people to rent anyway. So um, for me, when you just sort of allow tenants to make alterations to the home that you own as the landlord, I think that's difficult. Um, when I think the balance, you just can't get rid of a disruptive um, nuisance tenant uh, or, um, easily. I think those things don't work. Thank you for that. We'll go to Damien. I, th I think um, with the uncertainty in the legislation and um, the Art Party is, is totally for the best facilities that a renter can experience for the price they pay, but I think there is there is an imbalance now where a lot of these uh, uh, investors will sell up and leave, which will r cause rents to rise. It's, it's a fact. And every co extra bit of cost gets passed on. So... You know, there needs to be an equitable and fair deal um, between, it's a two-way street between a landlord and a tenant. And most, most tenants that actually look after places stay want to stay long term. And the worst thing is getting turfed out um, when you're three months or six months into a contract because somebody wants to sell. Um, so that's going to start happening. And, and for young people, that certainty of um, the rental space and having a roof over your head when you're starting your first job or you're starting your family, it's really, really important. Look, fundamentally, I think housing is a human right and we do need to make sure that our country provides the right places for people to live in. And it's not just often rentals are not just a house, but it's a home. And so I think it's to recognise that there is an inherent power imbalance between the landlord and the tenant. And how do we actually protect the tenant in terms of when they, cre um, when they create a home out of the house that they've rented from the landlord and they've, you know, adjusted their children to the local schools and to actually be, you know, part of the local community, how do we protect their right? to stay in that home and to actually make sure that, you know, against all of our health and all of our um, other social problems, that their, their children and themselves will be better off in that rental home. So I definitely think um, there's never too far in terms of we do need to protect and pr keep providing healthy and stable homes. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're now going to move on to our last section, which is on the environment. And the question there reads, are you happy with the government's current approach to climate action? Uh, just to note on audience questions, we're seeing some really good audience questions coming on a diverse range of topics. Uh, we are going to have time for some general questions, so please keep sending them through on Zetings and through Facebook. But just briefly, you're going to get a chance to talk a little bit more, but yes or no, are you happy with the government's approach to climate action? Absolutely, yes. But I'll say we can keep doing lots more. And Damien, yes or no? Uh, no. And Chris? No, it needs a real problem solution response and some action. Okay, well, looking on the screen, uh, we've got 13% uh, saying yes, they're happy with the government's uh, current approach to climate action, and 90% saying no. Okay, uh, we're going to go to our first question. The call for action on climate change has become more apparent in the past couple of years. For example, with the International School Strikes for Climate movement, where many argue that there is still not enough being done in the New Zealand context. If elected, what steps would you take in response to climate action? Uh, and why don't we lead with uh, Nacy? Look, for, for me personally, I think this is... Um, a, a not only will I support all of the Labour Party policies in terms of creating that, you know, 11,000 jobs for the environment so that we've got to clean up our rivers, we've got to look after the environment, we've got to look at... So we, we've, you know, our zero, our zero carbon emission bills, we've started to really set in place all of the legal infrastructure, all of the legislation to make sure that we are looking after the environment. But like I said at the beginning, more can be done. And I guess as a millennial within the Labour Party caucus, hopefully one day, that I will be able to keep going and to look at new and more technology innovative solutions that we pay, uh, that we are able to um, adopt for this whole entire complex problem that is climate change. Damien. Yeah, the, the, the ACT um, policy is to um, look at climate change from a different point of view 
in the sense that we need to make, build a modern tech economy. I don't know if a lot of people would know, but everything that we have here goes into landfill. And cities like Copenhagen, you can convert that landfill to energy. The Greens think, oh, we put more taxes on to disincentivize me, but you can't get, you can't tax where you wear to climate change or prosperity. And so one of the things we have to do is have a really honest conversation about the carbon bill, and we're going to repeal it, to, to change it to actually benchmark ourselves against the top five OECD countries or our training partners, so we're not disadvantaged. Now, in, in terms of the environment, um, we've, we've got the most natural resources in in, in, per capita than even Australia and we need to find ways to manage this without arguing with each other. Yeah, look, I mean, I've been a big supporter of sustainability in a broad sense, not just environmentalism and um, whether it's been at Unilever or in New Zealand creating those corporate good practices of how business is put into the bloodstream of what they're doing and also the Climate Leaders Coalition and Aotearoa Circle which are organisations designed to protect natural capitals, etc. I mean, the, the key thing on this is, what I say is we have to get really pragmatic and get to problem solution mode. And so when you break down our emissions to get to a low emission carbon environment for New Zealand, we've got 50% of it sitting in agriculture. We could apply best practice and maybe halve that. When I talk to the Danish Federated Farmers equivalent um, and I see the top 1,500 farms here in New Zealand, there's continued investment and progress on best practice. You might still only get half the way there. Then you've got to have a conversation around, do you want to modify ryegrass? Do you want to put inhibitors? Uh, you know, what sort of technology do you want to do to get the rest of that gap down? The big opportunity is in transport. 20% is in transport and driving into electric vehicles. We've got 90% renewable electricity uh, and building out that plan is a really good thing to do. Um, and the last bit's on manufacturing. That gets a lot of to what, to what Damien's talking about around waste management. Thanks. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question, which is uh, in April of 2019, the Ministry for the Environment and Stats New Zealand produced a report titled Environment Aotearoa 2019, outl outlining the top environmental issues in Auckland. Some of these were polluted waterways, threatened native plants and ecosystems, and the impacts of fishing practices on oceans' health. What are your party's response to addressing these issues? Uh, also, uh, we've got a question which is kind of along the same lines from Amy, which is, what would you do locally in our specific area to improve the natural environment and our sustainability? So what are you doing on environmental issues in Auckland, and what are you doing in our local environment? And uh, why don't we start uh, with Chris? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think the... Um the, the first thing I'd say is on a local level, I mean, the thing that we've got to manage is urban planning and development. And so when you think about Steward Motors, which is the, the site, 5,000 metre site opposite Howick College, it's wanting to put 56 to 71 units in that building. Uh, that's just putting a huge drain on stormwater systems, freshwater systems. When it rains, actually, we get sewage bubbling up in the creeks down to the bottom of Trelawne Place and all over that sort of place. There's not enough parking in place. So we've actually got to get much more strategic with our planning. You build dense housing above uh, transport hubs and then you build out shopping and other infrastructure around the back of that. So that, that's job number one, is get strategic around where we do development and how we do development. The second thing I'd say is infrastructure is very critical because infrastructure has economic, social and environmental benefits. So one of the big things this country will face is investing in our three waters infrastructure. So when we start to invest in upgrading our water infrastructure, we start stopping 80% of Auckland beaches not meeting um, you know, environmental standards. And so infrastructure is a way through which we get environmental benefits. Damien. Yeah, again, we need to start using smart technology. We need to take the best practices around the world, bring them here. Um, one of the problems with the Resource Management Act, it doesn't allow us to actually use technology. It doesn't allow us to actually put things in the right place to process landfill, as an example, and waste, which is the big problem I mean, people don't talk about. And it's something the council's incentivized because you can add levies onto it. So um, a whole rethink needs to happen there. And uh, in terms of uh, transport, um, Chris has made the points already. There's huge efficiencies to begin there. But again, the question is, do we want to build a smart economy or do we want to go on for the next 50 years with the legacy systems that we've got? Nacy, Auckland and local issues. I think um, already, obviously, we know that the Labour Party has committed to cleaning up our waterways, and we've already done that, especially in this COVID climate of setting all those new jobs and also implementing our own national, um, new national plan to clean up our waterways. And I think that's about setting up the pollutant um, expectations of and restrictions around our waterways and actually to clean up the water. So there, I, I think I definitely agree that water is our first and primary and most valuable resource, and it's about making sure our rivers become swimmable and also to make sure that 
our drinking water and everything is ready there for our um, for our use. But also, I think for um, the local botany area, I think um, definitely to have that environmental perspective. And I think a lot of the, um, the the issues that Chris was talking about is around planning as well, and it is around um, local uh, local board and also council as well. And so what I vow to do is to bring everyone to the table and we put in that a uh, perspective of the environment and to look at those issues and to see what decisions we can make together to make sure that um, botany is a really sustainable electorate that really has environment that everyone will cherish. Thanks everyone. Uh, so that's the last of our prepared sections. So now we've got about 20 minutes to cover uh, audience questions, which we're really excited about. So uh, please keep those audience questions coming in. We've got quite a few covering a range of topics. You can do that through Zetings. That's uh, youth.org.nz slash HYC, or alternatively by commenting on our Facebook page. Uh, the first one will be a bit of a fun one for viewers at home, uh, and we're going to ask by anonymous, would you ban TikTok? Uh, and, you know, uh, we hear the candidates laughing, but, you know, this is a reasonably serious issue internationally, and we've seen some countries take that step. So do, we've got a, do we have a volunteer to take this one on? Um, can we just say that actually in New Zealand we can't, <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, actually, I did, I did ask Andrew Little this as well, so no, the answer is no. <laughs> Cool. Uh, would anyone else, uh, Chris, do you, do you have some comments there? No, I don't have any comments on that. <laughs> cool. Okay, so, so the candidates don't have comments, but um, obviously um, major international policy and some stuff that's uh, really happening. Okay. We're going to move on to the next question, though, and uh, keeping our international focus. In a world of struggling with conflict and poverty, what role ought New Zealand play in fostering prosperity internationally? Uh, Damien. Yeah, well, I think we've got a massive opportunity in New Zealand to be sort of the Switzerland of the Pacific if we embrace um, our role as leaders and not retreat into our shells after this COVID incident, but take this opportunity to really rethink all our systems and all our reach internationally, whether it's through free trade agreements, as was mentioned earlier, um, our global network uh, of, of people who live in other countries, and also our banking system where we need to um, make money available for young people to, to achieve their dreams. So um, internationally, I think we're in a good, we, we could be in a very good place if we hold our nerve and, and build, build out of this. And what about you, Chris? You've obviously had a fairly international perspective over the last few years. Oh. Yeah, well, look, I mean, New Zealand's 5 million people on two rocks in the South Pacific Ocean in a world of 195 other countries and 7.8 billion people. So uh, we won't get rich just selling stuff to each other. We've got to get rich by actually engaging with the world and being part of the world. A lot of people would say to me, Chris, you know, your lovely, cute little small country, it's great, uh, but why, why do you matter in the world? Well, we matter a lot because fundamentally the thing that we export to the world is kaitiaki, the guardianship of people economically and socially and place environmentally. And so we have all the problems of Western Europe and North America and we actually can be a petri dish where we work some of these things out because through our history we we name our problems we wrestle with them and we resolve them and so whether that's giving women the vote whether it's youth suicide whether it's a whole bunch of issues that we've been talking about tonight we should have the courage to tackle those things and, and generate solutions and export those ideas to the world and Nacy. Look, I think for us definitely we need to own the fact that we can be a world leader in a lot of these aspects. And that includes, you know, when um, cri after Christchurch shootings happen, is to see Jacinda's respond, you know, being um, not only a poor but being, you know, an inspiration to countries all around the world. And so I think with a government and with a country that leads with kindness and that is inclusive, an economy that's inclusive, and that also includes how we treat our people, you know, with disabilities or it's different ethnicities. And if they're able to come to New Zealand and then build a home for themselves, if we're able to thrive together in our economy, together in this country, then I think together we will solve a lot of those problems. But I think we definitely need to start by recognising who we are as New Zealanders and who are New Zealanders as well. Cool. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to uh, a question uh, from online as well. Uh, it's a little bit uh, wordy <laughs> there. Um, but uh, what we got, it, it, the, the question is about. Uh, infrastructure planning and as someone who works there, I think he suggests uh, that there's a choice triangle between quality of services, speed and costs when we're uh, planning for resource management and that we've got to make some choices about what we balance. He says, Andrew says, reform can sound nice and blaming regulations and authorities is easy, but from a, a wider societal perspective, we're not really trying to do this properly. As it is, in effect, we're getting what we pay for. So we're getting what we pay for in terms of not spending enough on uh, resource or resourcing, you know, resource management and consenting. Does anyone have any views on that? 
Yeah, I mean, um, a few years back I was asked by the Singaporean government to come up and spend three days with them talking about innovation, and I sat with the Minister of Transport and Infrastructure on his 43rd floor, and I looked out over Singapore, and they were reclaiming land from the sea, they were building apartments in 15 months, but they had the tube stop ready to go well before those apartments were going to be built. Uh, you come in on a motorway that turns into a runway and a military fighter jet, uh, you've got a desalination plant, There's a, you've got to move a port from one side of the, of the city to the other side of the city really quickly. You come home to New Zealand, and what you realise we're world class at is putting cones out. We actually don't get things done. And so we do need that master plan from top to bottom, not a politicised slush fund that sort of depends on where things get invested. We do need to think about financing, we do need to think about legislation, and we think about execution, about how we actually do it. So I hear what the question is, it's a great question, and I think you're right about that. Cool. Uh, anyone else want to take on that one? Damien? Yeah, I mean, just to follow on with the points from Christopher, um, I think one of ACT's objectives is to take the politics out of all these decision making and, you know, have independent commission that the buck stops there with a long term 30, 50 year view. Um, we have to admit, even though we think we're world class, maybe we are at rugby and the airline, um, but we're just, you know, we're in a very competitive world where, okay, we've got a great ski field and, um, you know, and, and, but it's, it's only one of a great ski field at the world. So there's so much competition now for young people and industry, and we need to really embrace that with sustainability and make that our platform. Nice. My answer would definitely be it's still the people, he tangta, he tangta, he tangta. if we have the right skill sets within our economy, if we have the right people. So actually I'm really excited this time about COVID bringing back a lot of our really skilled workers, um, our, our New Zealanders coming back into the country. And I'm hoping that actually we really leverage that so that we actually have these expertise from around the world come back into New Zealand and to really help us to look at what skill sets we need to reform our, um, definitely our infrastructure. Did you want to move it there, Damien? Yeah, just, just on the skill set question, because I've done a lot of work on the custom statistics. There's actually more people leaving New Zealand than coming in, and um, they're being locked up in other countries. Look, I totally agree. I don't want I don't want uh, somebody building a, a tunnel that isn't a French engineer, or somebody trying to do it over Zoom, right? Uh, you know, I want the expert here, and I want them to be paid well, and we want our people to learn from that. So, you know, there, there, there's there's options we have, and we just need to get on board with what the rest of the world's doing. Uh, hopefully you think you can be politicians over Zoom. Uh, we're gonna move to a, uh, uh, another one on infrastructure, and I guess also touching on housing. So if stormwater and other infrastructure issues were rapidly consented and fixed, would you support higher density housing and more apartments in East Auckland? Uh, yeah, Chris. Yeah, possibly, because the best practice globally is that you actually build a transport hub uh, and then you build dense apartment living above it and then you attract uh, shopping and then you attract restaurants and cafes and that's how it goes down. But I can tell you right now, the reason, you know, how, it, for example, how Cockle Bay is designated single housing zone. And so when you start mixing your drinks and actually saying we're going to put 70, 71 apartments on a 5,000 square metre section and we can't upgrade stormwater and, and parking and all the roading and all those sort of infrastructure things, around by two schools, that's a problem. So I think you can have it, you just got to get strategic on how you do the planning piece. Cool. Uh, Nacy. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think um, town planning is really, really important. So we have the areas for high density. We've got the areas that, um, I guess as a, as a migrant, I especially like New Zealand where they have a lot of um, houses with a garden. <laughs> and that's why we did come to New Zealand, why we chose to come to New Zealand. So I'd definitely like to keep a lot of the characters of that area of um, um, of East Auckland, of Botany especially, the way it is. But also, like I personally, I, I live in almost to myself. And so I see the high density, I see the affordability of those houses and they're really, really good. And so I think it's about having that mixed solution to a really complex problem. Cool. And Damien? Yeah, if you look at the housing stock that's been built over the last um, 10, 15 years here, it's been an incredible uh, explosion. Um, one of the gaps there might have been just the type of stock we've built um, and its fitness for purpose for young people to come out. No, normally you'd come out with, you, with your partner and, and, and you'd um, go into an apartment and you'd save and then you'd build on to, to go to your bigger house and that would be a life stage thing with regards to um, having a family or your family helping you out um, or the banks helping you out so maybe we need to look at just that first step uh, and, and, and have a look at what we're providing okay uh, and we're just going to do this one briefly um, because I know we spent some time talking about it but rehousing and land do you think we should consult the local iwi more often when it comes to erecting new buildings and infrastructure 
Nicey. Oh, absolutely. I think um, the tangata whenua of this land has a lot of um, also spiritual, I think, um, wisdom over this land and how it should be used. And definitely, I think, just the way that they deal with the resource. Because um, I've worked with actually a lot of Māori elders in terms of the RMA. I've, I've, I've asked a lot of questions, I guess. And I think they just really have a lot of wisdom about how to make sure that um, we are sustainable and we look after the Māori, the life force in our waters and then in our land. So I definitely 100% think that's really important. Damien. Yeah, it is really important, um, but I, I think also um, people's private property rights and security over their own land and home is equally as important. And we've seen it in a matter um, where that can all go wrong, and it's led to houses not being built. So uh, against the wishes of, of all parties. So, you know, one of the things that we got to respect is that under the Treaty of Waitangi, we are a nation um, with with a society that's structured equally, with race, colour, creed. And, um, but you know, one of the fundamental aspects in tenants is, is your private property rights. And Chris? Yeah, look, I agree, private property rights have to be protected. Uh, that's job number one. Uh, two, having said that, we do need to consult with, with iwi and Māori, uh, and they have a very valuable perspective on that. Um, again, it gets back to the speed of the consenting and the consultation process, and I think if you fix that, um, you know, I don't want people to think that consulting with iwi means that you're going to have a delay with the project. It doesn't have to be that way if you actually get your planning processes straight. Cool. Now, I think that's a really great segue into our next audience question. How do we tackle systemic racism? I think both, you know, we're watching what's happening globally on this as well as um, some of the local challenges that we face. Is there... Uh Nacy, you look ready to go. Um, this is definitely an issue that's really close to my heart. Um, whether it be, you know, in March 15th that we've actually, um, I think the Muslim community has over and over again raised this issue about them feeling being in danger and also that they know there are threats being made and yet I think uh, um, uh, we... I think we failed the Muslim community, and definitely myself as an Asian coming to New Zealand. Um, yes, it's. I think New Zealand is one of the best countries for a migrant to grow up in, but also I think there it's still there. I don't want to um, act as if it's not there. So I think first of all, um, that's probably one of the main reasons why I put my hands up to go into Parliament is to, for people to see people like me to, who, who grew up in New Zealand, who is a migrant, um, being able to represent them and their voices um, in Parliament. But 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 by also encouraging more young people to get onto boards. So so that's actually one of the topics I've been really, really passionate about. Chris, systemic racism. Yeah, look, I did a lot of work around this at Air New Zealand, to be honest. Um, and, you know, really it comes down to us being able to walk in each other's shoes and walk across the room and find out what it's like and what that lived experience has been for that other person. And there are real systemic ways in which you break down unconscious bias. And so, um, you know, the first and foremost, you need to form, uh, you know, we do it, for example, we do it in the National Party, right? We have communities within the National Party uh, that actually present their views in a really articulate way that forces us to uh, think about how we evolve and become more more mainstream and more diverse as an organisation. Diversity is absolutely critical in our country. It makes the country richer in an economic and cultural sense, uh, and we've got to keep working hard to make sure there isn't systemic racism in this country. Damien. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, New Zealand, I find, is one of the, uh, even though we underestimate it, one of the best countries in the world to, to be. Um, I don't think it's as big an issue as people make out. Uh, the Christchurch massacre was atrocious and um, you know but somebody else did that and you know we it, but it taught us lessons about how we react as a society but I think um, I don't think it's systemic I think we just have to spend more time with each other and certainly in botany it is as Chris said earlier the you know the epicenter of that potential change I think it all boils down to whether you value diversity or not. And, you know, diversity in all leadership roles, whether it's in the community, whether it's in business, whether in government, leads to different perspectives, it leads to different lived experiences, and it actually leads to better outcomes, you know. I can tell you in a business sense, a diverse board, a diverse executive team will have a 30% better result. So it may feel uncomfortable because you may not know people that are different from you, and therefore don't consume the same media, don't just hang around with the same people, have the courage to get out and learn about someone new or different from you. Yeah, and I also definitely think it's about giving the power to the people as well. And it's about recognising, especially I love how Christy talked about boards as well, because I think being able to have people of different diverse ethnicity, background, age, um, disability, abilities, I think is to give them the power to self-determination and to give them that power to be part of the um, decision-making uh, mechanics of this society, but of different organisations and companies as well. So I definitely think that's something we need to promote a little bit more. Cool. Well... Uh, 
we've also had a question come in about what do you think about the situation in Xinjiang, China? And we've got a volunteer for that one. Maybe it's aimed at me, um, but look, I think um, for me, I think when Chris just said you need to consume different media, I think that's something I would definitely encourage a lot of people to do. I think it's definitely atrocious, and I think it's in terms of um, recognizing a particular group of people. But I think also in China there has been security um, problems in that area for a really, really long time. There's people with machetes on the roads. So what I'm saying is there's definitely lots and lots of multifaceted different uh, ways of stories to that one single. So I would um, probably encourage people not to just consume the Western messaging, but to also look at different, all different perspectives on that issue. But once again, New Zealand has a really, really strong diplomatic policy in that area already, and I fully support it. Uh, Chris, do you have a view there? We're talking about the Uyghurs? Y yes, yes. Yeah. Um, look, I think, um, let's be clear, um, the world is moving into quite a different place, and New Zealand's going to have some really big geopolitical challenges to face up to in the next five years. Um, you've got a world that's increasingly populist. Um, you've got both you know, China first, the US first, you know, India first. Um, you've got a lot of nationalism and populism sitting out there in the global uh, environment. Um, New Zealand needs to protect its own interests and it needs to be a good um, call out of, uh, of the standards we expect to see in the world. And uh, we want to be a model for those in our own country and we should call them out uh, while protecting our own interests uh, when we see them. Okay, and Damien. Yeah, n not much more to add th th from the other two candidates, but you know, Freedom and liberty is becoming a vital commodity in life, and uh, but every got, got their own situation. I agree that sometimes we don't get all the media messages through the Western system, so I respect that too. And uh, I guess sticking with the uh, trend of I guess hard hitting questions uh, from the audience, do you think religion should play no role in politics? And uh, Chris. Yeah, I do. I think there should be a very strong separation between church and state. Uh, someone like me can have a personal faith, but it's not my job to proselytise that on, on all New Zealanders. Uh, that's something that is personal to me, and that's uh, something that uh, we've got very, very clear rules around. Not rules, but just we want to be able to govern for all New Zealanders, irrespective of religion, irrespective of, of race, irrespective of, of where they've come from. So for me, yes, it gives me massive amounts of personal uh, benefit of having a personal faith, and whether people have that view or not, that's up to them. Uh, but as a politician, there is no place for uh, mixing um, religion with state. Damien. Yeah, um, the Act policy is very clear on this. Um, everyone's free to practice uh, their faith and uh, there is a separation between politics and that. And um, long may that continue. And Macy. Absolutely. Um, I mean, without sounding repetitive, I think I want to explore a different area of it, which is to support the freedom of, um, of religion. And, and s uh, that is especially like after March we're saying, to support our Muslim community so that they feel empowered um, in their places of worship and that every religion in New Zealand feels safe to express their own religious views. But also it's about, um, I think, from government perspective, is to work with different uh, all these different organisations so that they have a voice um, and so that we hear their voice but not have them directly involved in politics, definitely, yes. Okay, going to move to an issue that's uh, dear to the heart. Sorry, sorry, oh, yeah. I think you do want people of faith involved in politics. I mean, if you, if, you know, it's, it's okay to be <laughs> of faith to, to be in politics. <laughs> yeah. It's just making sure that, as you say, we've got freedom of, of religion and you don't end up proselytising your views into, into national policy that's for the benefit of everybody. Cool. Uh, we're going to move to an issue that's close to the hearts of uh, some of us on the Youth Council. Would you support lowering the voting age to 16? Yes, absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, but by the way, that's not a Labour Party policy position. That's my personal view. Cool. Okay, Chris and uh, Damien. Oh. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't thought too deeply about that one. Um, it's a good. It's a great question, and I'm, I'm aware of um, you know two of the young people that have been activating in that space around that. Um, it's something I just want to go on a bit of a journey and understand a bit more. To be honest, um, I don't have an answer for you right now. And what about you, Damien? I've got a 16-year-old, <laughs> <laughs> and her opinions vary from day to day. Um, I think she's going to get her democratic right um, when she's 18. I think it's probably, um, yeah, it, 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 I'm on that journey too. I'd like to see much more depth and discussion about it than currently exists. Cool. Okay. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, this one was uh, obviously in the news recently. What are your opinions on the privately run Green School in Taranaki that had $11.7 million of funding from the government? Uh, some some hard-hitting questions out there tonight. Uh, 
Cra- well, Chris, oh, yeah, nice. We'll give you, you the know, chance. I think we'll probably I should start by saying, first of all, that didn't come out of our education fund and that Labour is still making historical investments into every single state-owned school. So I think that's really, really important that we have been supporting our education sector and obviously we've been giving equity pay to our teachers and also putting mental health um, nurses into these schools. So I think, first of all, Labour is really, really, really big on um, education, but also that green um, school was a infrastructure, so ready project that um, James Shaw signed off on so I'll, I'll just I think I'll just give that background context first Nazy that is massive that is massive hypocrisy in the extreme um, there is no way that that policy holds water at all um, you just you know we've got a truckload of problems with our schools let's just take Ormiston primary school there's 750 kids for that school it's got got 950 today and there's 10 new kids showing up typically each week and it needs a new building to actually be able to handle that accommodation and those number of students and yet we go spend 12 million dollars with a price private school. So I think all of us would just say, no, nah, that, that dog don't hunt. That wasn't a good idea. Nancy, do you want a chance to respond there or are you? No, I think I think it was, first of all, it was James Shaw who signed off on it. But look, we are in making really, really big investment. I think the underfunding did come from the nine years of national government. And so we're trying to actually fill up that hole that's been left there by the previous government. And so we're doing everything that we can. And obviously we can do more as well. And we're looking forward to doing more in the next government, actually. Will you be funding more state schools, private schools? No, look, <laughs> this is, was a shovel-ready project in terms of infrastructure, so it's got nothing to do with our um, education policy at all. Damien. This just sums up what's been wrong with this government for the last three years. You know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, w- we had a system for charter schools which was giving disadvantaged kids and Maori p- kids the ability to strive and to get out of the system and it was cynically killed by those parties. And to see this come up uh, at this time, however way you want to justify it, I mean, the Greens need to go from Parliament. I'm sorry, it's unjustifiable. Um, you know, how the Labour system let that go through um, and, and not check and balance it, it just sums up what's wrong. Cool. Okay, uh, we're going to go to our final audience question. I know some of these have been uh, fairly hard hitting, but hopefully this question gives you a chance. Uh, you'll get a closing statement uh, at the end, but you know, do you, uh, give you an opportunity to specifically talk to the young people out there watching tonight. What policies that you or your party support that will benefit the young people of New Zealand as they go out to vote? And do we volunteer for that or? Uh, Nacy, why don't you go yeah. first? So look, I think what we need to do is create a really equitable economy um, post-COVID and to keep moving forward. And what we do is we need to support young people into their training. We need to rebuild the economy. We need to create more jobs. We need to be supporting our young, uh, our small businesses who might be the employers of our young people. And also we need to position New Zealand globally. And look, I truly believe young people are the leaders of tomorrow. And so that when we say New Zealand needs to be positioned well off globally, I think that is to create a better economy and a better future for young people. But also, I would really, I would like to take this opportunity to just to say, don't give up your democratic rights. Please go make sure that you're enrolled and you're voting, because that's the only way that we get recognised. And we make sure that we look after the environment and we take New Zealand into the future in a more sustainable manner. Chris, your pitch to young people. Look, I think you've really got to take a, a, a big step back and say who's best m- to manage the economy going forward. And again, as I said, it's not an economy because it's all maths. It's actually an economy about people. And really, you as young people are going to be more impacted and going to be living with these decisions for longer than anybody. So what I'd say is don't be cynical about the process. Actually, you know, get involved and actually understand uh, the respective party positions and go with who you think. But I mean, I would put it to you very simply that a national party has great economic credentials. It knows how to navigate these kind of waters. We've done it before through the GFC through the Christchurch earthquake, and we've got to really do this job incredibly well. We've got a great future the next 30 years. It's a great life for you guys, but the next three to five are mission critical. And Damien? Yeah, we'd like to be really practical really quickly and uh, put money in your back pocket. Um, We'd like to take away the debt burden that everyone's going to experience and control that debt and make it more efficient. Um, But your mental health and well-being and your opportunity to be successful and, and have great relationships with people in your community, especially around here, um, you know, they all have to be protected. So one of the one of the th- theses that we have is get, get politics out of people's lives, uh, strive for freedom, strive for prosperity, and um, be wealthy in all aspects, whether it be financially or in your health. Thanks. Now, we're going to move on to uh, Denitza, who will take us through closing statements. Um, your chance to pitch, I guess, to the wider botany electorate and to those watching at home. 
So this time you'll have 60 seconds to give us your final pitch as to why you should be elected. This time we'll go in reverse alphabetical order by last name, starting with Damien. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity at home this evening to listen and be uh, informed. Um, we hope there's a place for some of you or all of you at the ACT Party uh, through our youth forum or um, as you come into the mainstream. And I think there is an intergenerational shift uh, happening in politics, whether at a, at a local level or at a national level, where young people have a go, get in and um, y you know take everybody on, keep, keep the spirit alive. And I think in this area, um, we've got a lot of natural advantages, uh, lots of opportunity to explore. We've got the airport down the road. We're hoping one day we get that border open and you can go and fly again and experience the real world. Um, but in the short term, look after your parents, look after yourselves. Um, and uh, if I go to Parliament, I'll, I really will be working hard for the community here. We'll now go to Chris. Yeah, look, uh, can I just say, look, thank you for the questions. It's been quite hard to answer them within 45 seconds because I think you know, they're big questions and they need a bit of unpacking, to be honest, if we do, do justice to them. Um, what I'd say is, look, I've lived overseas for 16 years. I've had the privilege of seeing the good and bad of lots of different countries and political systems. New Zealand is a special place. We should be very proud of it. But we do have some real challenges ahead of us and we have some tremendous opportunities in front of us as well. And I think we need to solve those strategically, not tactically. I think um, the skills that I bring, hopefully, of setting a vision and having people follow, of being able to build teams and culture, being able to solve problems, uh, being able to work with diverse stakeholders, and most importantly, be able to get things done for, with, and through people is really important. I hit it having done some practical real world experience. I want to do public service and do a political career as best as I possibly can. I'm not a career politician, uh, and I think that brings a different perspective. Awesome, and we'll finish off with Nacy. I'm really hoping that through um, my work here in Botany as well, and, and if I get the privilege of representing Botany, is to really bring our communities together. Um, hopefully that I will be able to raise a voice in Parliament and Wellington within the Labour government, but also um, to represent all these different diverse groups within our communities and to really to um, join all of us together so that we really feel like Botany is our home and that we are connected with our neighbours and throughout our communities. Look, um, for Labour, it's really important that we keep moving on our five-point plan, five plan. It's really important that we've already started and we've got to see it through. It's about investing in our young people. It's about creating jobs. And I really hope that that benefit gets brought into Botany as well, especially for our small businesses, the supports that we're seeing, and also that our young people really do grow up in the best electorate in New Zealand. Awesome, and we've got one more final audience poll for tonight. Do you know who you're voting for? So early in the night before any candidates had a chance to speak, we had 68% of people who had no idea yet. So we'll see if there's been an improvement over the course of the night. So far looking positive. Cool, and uh, yeah, a big shout out also to those who've been watching it at home. We've had about 1,250 views on Facebook and um, lots of you watching uh, concurrently as well. Um, oh, sitting at 50-50 right now. <laughs> Slight improvement. <laughs> it was 100% last <laughs> night. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, but it sounds like our candidates have done a great job of, uh, I think, uh, putting some thoughts, I think, for you to think about as the community and uh, giving you lots to mull over. Uh, I'll hand over to Liane to close. That brings us to the end of our event. We hope this has been a meaningful experience and that you were able to engage with the candidates and our topics despite the digital format. Thank you to each of our candidates for coming tonight. Thank you to Ormiston Senior College for, pro for providing our venue tonight. Thank you again to NUNC for managing the live streaming. I'd also like to mention again the other members of the Howick Youth Council's Team 5, Daniela, Anik and Amy, who weren't able to be here tonight, but all contributed to making this project a reality. If you're interested in the many other diverse project, projects of the Howick Youth Council, follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay updated with our activity. You can also sign up on our mailing list via our website. Hera kue te wiki o te reo Māori. Have a great Māori language week.